That's so fetch! Does IPv6. anybody know this movie? Because I had to look it up. Yes. <laughs> mean Girl. Yeah. Alright! Alright, I had to look it up. Special thanks to my buddy Simmeril, who is not here. He's strangely enough in Toledo. Penguin Con, 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 Con 2015. Con you live closer to it than I do. <sighs> I need an avenue speaker notes for this one. You can't see them either, can you? Okay, next slide. Okay, so if you all read the uh, synopsis, I apologize in advance because the story goes that on the last day that they were accepting talk submissions, um, I got really drunk and said, Hey, Nate! AKA hey, myself. Is myself here? I haven't seen him. I mean, you sort of look like him, but you're not him. Um, okay, Nate's not here. He totally said, you should totally do that talk. That's a great idea. And so I threw together what you see in the program, and then I sent this, and they totally didn't get it. I'm not going to read it to you. I will apologize in advance. I forgot to bring the big bucket of shoe balls that you could throw at me whenever you want to have a question. Um, that's all I'm going to say on that. Because, um, yeah, okay, so... Oh, why you should listen to what I have to say, um, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're hitting some of them. Yeah, I mean, that was me and the Millennium Falcon, I have to confess. It was a long time ago, I was young, I was reckless, <laughs> and cut it a little close. Um, I am the Senior Network Engineer Systems Administrator and Lead Software Developer for a medium-sized internet service provider called Amplex Internet. We're based out of Northwest Ohio. We started years and years and years ago doing wireless to the home, and now we do fiber to the home. Uh, and I've been there ever since it was just the owner and me, and now we have 20-some employees, and we keep firing people because we suck at finding good talent. And we have like about a one in five success ratio. Wow, you're recording this, aren't you? <laughs> don't, don't that out. My boss does not need to hear that. <laughs> well, basically um, what you just said is you're willing to pay me a lot of money. <laughs> For a little while. Well, I, you know, if I'm going to make it, that would be, that'd be a fun <laughs> trick, because I don't have any, especially because um, I spent way too much money at the hotel bar the other night. Um, my beautiful wife is driving this whole thing, and I appreciate you coming. Um, honey, what's the next slide? Oh, yes. This is my inspired sp slide. Um, I, I am not kidding when I say that this is the only image that I actually got permission to use. For those of you who don't know, this is Bruce Potter. Bruce Potter and his wife Heidi founded, or well, with a few other people, they founded the Schmoo Group, which is a hacker collective security infosec thing. They do ShmooCon in January in Washington, D.C. every year. If you are an infosec nerd or a tech nerd, I highly suggest that you do this because, or go to this if you can, because the tickets are hard to get, because they sell out in like 17 seconds. Dead serious, they go on sale at like noon, and by noon in 17 seconds, they're all gone. I've gone for the last two years. It is the most fun you can have with your pants on, or in my case, your panties on, whatever. Um, the reason that I bring Bruce up is that at the, tar at the start of any talk Bruce talks about, he tells you why you shouldn't listen to him. Bruce and I have a lot in common. We are both college dropouts. I have no degree. I have no certifications. I am not a CISSP. I am not A+. Plus. I am not Network+. Plus. I am not whatever the hell the vote <coughs> is. I don't have the Microsoft alphabet soup of certifications, nor do I have any intention of ever getting any of them. I have absolutely no formal training. I was really bad at college. I barely went, and when I did go, I was drunk. I love learning. I think you're really good at college. <laughs> For certain standpoints, yeah. For certain standpoints, definitely. Um, and the most important thing you might want to take away from this is I am speaking completely from the viewpoint of a last mile provider. I'm an internet service provider. I am not a content provider. I deliver porn and kitty cats to people's homes for a living. <laughs> Dead serious. That's got to be 80% of my traffic. Don't get those confused. I'm not kitty porn. <laughs> Actually, you should see. One of the worst things you can do when you work as a network technician at an ISP is when you have a customer who's got a throughput issue and you fire up the traffic analyzer, do not reverse resolve any of the traffic that comes back. <laughs> Barnyardfun.com is a thing, or at least it was a couple of years ago. So anyways, the reason that I like Bruce so much is that we both have this thing. Hey, there's Nate. I, I warned you I'd show up at this. I make good on Well, I was right. just telling the audience how this is entirely your fault. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> later. everybody, this is Nate. This is his fault. 
<laughs> Put him up um, the reason that I like Bruce is that we both have long hair, we both drink the same kind of beer, we both wear our sunglasses entirely too much, have all that stuff that's on the screen entirely in common. In other words, he reminds me of somebody that I like a whole lot, namely me. Okay, so the meta slide. I'm going to talk about three basic things. First of all, we're going to look at um, doggy, doji, I don't, I don't know what it is. And uh, we're going to dispel some IPv6 myths. Then I'm actually going to talk about what is actually cool about IPv6. And at that point, I will actually try to stop bitching about how much I hate IPv6 and IPv6 advocacy, which is what I really hate. And we'll talk about what is standing in the way. What I want to point out is that I don't have all the answers. Like I said, I am coming from the standpoint of an IPv6 possible carrier. And I'm coming from the frustrations of five years of trying to get this to end users who don't give a shit. It's less than don't give a shit, because when DHCP doesn't work in IPv4, they call in and say, hey, my network doesn't work. When DHCP and IPv6 doesn't work, they don't notice. <laughs> it's a different problem set. Anyways, the reality is I'll just be complaining for the next hour. And um, originally this was planned to be about a half hour of uh, talk, and I was hoping that people would ask questions and tell me I'm an idiot. So, oh hey, we've moved on! <laughs> IPv6 myths! I love these! So yeah, so much address space, I love that one. Uh, so complex, I actually don't talk about that. It's kind of an overwhelming umbrella sort of thing. Um, that's supposed to say f never net. There's an N. It's like right there on the edge of the screen. It's not really well calibrated. Maybe we should just back the whole thing up an inch or so. I don't know. Um, never renumbering. Hey, 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 nicely done, honey bunny. <sighs> I'm sorry, some of these are memes, some of them are actually technical slides. I think the next one is space, which is actually one of my big pet peeves about uh, IPv6. Honey, next slide, please. Such space, yes! Two to the 128th possible IP addresses, which people like to talk. It's 340, you decillion. I think that's how you say it. I think that's how you say it, I'm not sure. Undecillion. Undecillion? Thank you to the man in the Xenos shirt. Alright, undecillion. What's interesting about that is, when you think about how it's actually carved up, it's actually significantly less. Also, because of INAA, IANA regulations, it's actually significantly less than that. It's actually more like 48 you, um, Say it again for me. Undecillion? Undecillion. 48 undecillion possible IP addresses. Because it turns out, to have a publicly routable IP address in IPv6, it better start with a 2 or a 3. You can't have one that starts with 1. Just can't. Can't have one that starts with 4 through F. Even though those are totally valid, yes. Those it's going to change. They've held those in reserve just in case the way that they're doing it, which is here, everybody have trillions of IP addresses, turns out to be a bad idea. Yes, yes, and um, <laughs> I'll, I'll cover that. I'll cover that. Cool. It's, it's, it literally is a stupid bureaucratic uh, n uh, mistake that is open for interpretation. But what I'm actually getting at in this is I actually feel that this, this notion of thinking about IPv6 as enough IP addresses to give every atom on the earth its own IP address is wrong. I think that when you come at people, which I will talk about later, when you come at people with this and you say, here's how big your IP space is, I think they literally stick their heads in the ground and hide because it's scary how big it is. What you really got to break it down to is, what are you really getting out of IPv6? You have essentially the current IPv4 address space, 2 to the 32 power, of potential networks. So 4.29 something 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 billion. But instead of 4.29 addresses, we have 4.29 billion networks. Each of those is carved into 65,556 potential smaller networks, and each of those is carved into 65,556 even smaller local broadcast domain segment networks. Um, and if you're doing anything other than these prefixes, you're making your life a hell of a lot harder. Because IPv6 address space is actually so large that CIDR is no longer necessary, and this is just simply convenient. If you're allocating slash 56s, I hate you. Because you're making me do math, and I don't want to do math. I do love AT&T slash 60, though. <laughs> don't get me started. Don't get me started. AT&T's done a lot of right things. That's not one of them. Um, 
Okay, so on the scale, Slack. I love Slack. I basically refer to stateless address autoconfig as the church of Slack. Because everybody says, oh yeah, all you gotta do is, and I promise I will be done bitching eventually. Don't just, it's worth it. <laughs> everybody just says, oh, all you gotta do is plug in and you get a router and you've got IPv6 connectivity. Uh huh. Where's name resolution? Oh, well, Slack has got these extra fields that you bolt on and you say, oh, by the way, you should also do a DHCP broadcast to get your name resolution and possibly for prefix delegation. But um, DHCP v6 does everything that Slack does in a stateful way that logs. So why are we touting Slack? And it will become more apparent as I go on why I hate Slack so much. Basically, everybody thinks Slack is this new thing and it's going to fix everything. Slack is not new. Slack is descended completely from IPX, SPX. <laughs> it's exactly the same darn thing, except we actually managed to throw address name resolution out the window. And... We actually have stateless autoconfig and IPv4 and it didn't work all that well. I guarantee you, call up Best Buy Geek Squad and go, Hey, I've got this weird issue with my computer. The only IP address I ever get is 169.254.something.something.something. I shit you not. They will tell you that's an error code. It's not an error code. It's often the victim of something wrong. But it's not actually an error code. It just means I couldn't find anything else so I made my own address. People actually think this is an error, and this is where this is going to go. This is going to go the... <laughs> Honey, you're getting ahead of me here. <laughs> oh, we can talk about this. That this is still the awesomest slide I've ever seen. Okay. okay, so... Oh my god. One of the great things about IPv6 was that NAT is dead, right? No more NAT! NAT breaks end-to-end -end connectivity! Yeah, except that the enterprise is hopelessly married to NAT. You talk to quote-unquote network engineers, and some of them are fairly intelligent individuals, fairly good at solving problems, but they are married to this model of the natted network. They understand inside, outside, DMZ, and that's it. They don't get routed networks. They don't understand the difference between a NAT box and a router. They're like, wait, it's a router? That means that it goes from a 192.168 address to something else, right? Seriously, these people think this. The enterprise is married to this. Firewalls are built around this. Heck, my Roku at home, if it senses it's not natted, it stops working. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I work for an ISP. I had a slash 25 at my house. I tried to put a Roku on a public IP address. It wouldn't work. I had to nat it. I had to, I had to give up my, my like personal quest against nat and nat my Roku to get it working properly. And that is supposed to break more than it solves. We're in love with this. We can't get away from it. And honey, I actually need my speaker nuts for this slide, because I know there's a lot here. <laughs> oh wait, you don't have them either. Because no. <laughs> I didn't set it up right. Okay, I'll just sit up here. So these uh, are basically <laughs> morons that don't understand reflexive ACL. Yes. Can we just have them all removed from the industry and dumped into the cistern out in the front of the hotel? Well, you know, that would probably make all of our lives easier. But another reason, another reason that NAT is not going away is because long before there was the internet, there was this thing called the PCS, uh, PSTF, Public Telephone Services Network. Uh, I'm switch telephone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a phone guy. I, I work for a company that is now a phone company, and I hate it. Because whenever they can't fix something, they come to me. I go, I don't know anything about phones. <laughs> but I have to fix it anyways. Um, another reason is be at this point, the phone companies, which are by lar and large, by far and wide, delivering our internet to us, they have this concept known as a DMARC, line of demarcation. This is where their problem stops and your problem as the consumer starts. Without NAT, on a broadband network where you're going to be hooking up your iPad, and your iPhone, and your i-whatever, you know, your i ring, whatever it may be. <laughs> Everything that is internet enabled in your home. In IPv4 this was simple. Your ISP handed you a single address, you natted it. It's your problem on the inside, and depending on how nice they were, they might help you fix it when it breaks. I'm not helping you fix your i ring. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> Man, I'll help you fix yours. <laughs> Isn't that basically just what the Apple Watch is? Oh. Hiya! 
<laughs> Somebody give this man a drink. He wins, he wins the internet. This man deserves a drink. Um, what breaks down with this is, as an ISP, you're supposed to hand <coughs> your end user a slash 64 of routable address space. So, I have to have a slash 64, conceivably, on my my last mile segment where my V4 space is the last, last, last mile. But now I have to do a static route entry for a slash 64 into each and everybody's home. Because all of a sudden I'm supposed to care about that as an ISP. Um, our entire business model is built around something else, and I'm not saying we're not willing to work around it, but it's going to be a learning curve, especially for our Tier 1 and Tier 2 support teams. It's a nightmare and a half, and as I get onto this, that is what is not solved, and is what, what, what is the big problem going forward. Yo. So I'm missing something there. Why are we doing a static route per customer when that actually is what DHCP v6 was meant for, was picking up one address in the... Uh, Let's call it the exterior subnet mm -hmm. and actually handing out a slash 64 or a slash 48. Yes, but you still have to inject that into your routing table in some way, shape, or form. It is, I'm not saying it's a static address that you have to manually enter for every customer, but you got to get it into your routing table. Right. Somehow. And there's some hierarchical ways to eliminate some of the cruft that comes with that. But still, what it basically means is that ISPs now have to care care about your internal network in a new facet that they've never had to do before, and this is a problem. I, I'm not per se seeing that, because if you just hand a 48 to that router to hand out route the 48 to that router, which is what the 48 is meant for, mm -hmm. you have 65,535 slash 64s to hand out, and you can hand those out however you want, because your 48's already routed via OSPF v6 or whatever you've got. Mm -hmm. There, there, are to, there are facilities in place to do this on the carrier side. Name to me a uh, customer dealing router that does this consistently, that does this right. Well, this is why I ripped those out and replaced them with a Juniper SRX220. Okay, that is, a big, <laughs> that is a big portion of the later portion of this talk is we have this on the, on the content. We have V6 on the content. That's not a problem. That's not hard to do. Yo. Does the dealing have to be stock? <laughs> yeah, because DDWRT. We're talking about end users here, so yeah, basically it does. And that's a big problem. I'll get to that. And we'll address all this. Honey, next slide, because I forget where we are. Oh, yes. Yes. I loved this. This one goes back to never renumber. You don't have to renumber because everything past those double colons, let's say we're going to go through from, you know, 2001 Beef Coffee 66 to 2002 Feed Dead Doggy. I'm, That's awesome. I'm pretty sure that the 9 is an acceptable G. <laughs> right? Well, if not, feed that beef cafe. That would also work, but I was kind of going with the whole doggy theme, because I already sure. found a picture of doggy. You know, you know, the picture of doggy, and I found, I mean, I googled for it explicitly. <laughs> so, the theory was, you never have to remember anything. Because everything past the double colon, that's your 64 boundary, and it's never going to change. Slack is going to take care of all that. And all this other stuff, that's just, that's... You don't need to worry about that. Okay, so who's updating the quad A records? Does nobody care about this? This is one of my big beefs about V6 is nobody ever talks about DNS. They just go, oh, yeah, um, you do this stuff and it works. Be happy. It's the future now. We have dynamic updating for, you know, everything. Oh, yes, because that is so commonly supported. If it doesn't say Unix or basically Windows 2008 or above, it, yeah, it doesn't work. And like again, again, I'm, I'm getting to that. I'm kind of building to that. Um, on the content side, this stuff is all solved. This is all done. But provisioning this to last mile end users, really a big problem. Um, I think I'm almost done complaining about this, honey. What's the next slide? Oh yeah, just a couple of small ones. Ah, yes. Um, they always say the myth that IPsec is somehow ingrained into IPv6. Works exactly the same way it does in IPv4. It's just as much of a pain in the ass. It's not somehow this magically better thing. Holy shit, there's a lot of you in here. <laughs> I was going to get like five people, you know? Um, oh, yeah. Trust is hard. You're not going to solve this with a protocol. This is outside the purview of a routing protocol. And um, QoS, 
the QoS that was supposed to be ingrained into IPv6 was basically the same thing that got bolted onto IPv4, and then everybody gutted it and replaced it with DSCP. But I'm not going to talk too much about those because they're not terribly relevant to the talk. These are both problems that have been solved. Ah, yes! Mr. <laughs> Philip J. Fry. So what's my point? I promise I'm mostly done bitching at this point. Now we're going to talk about what IPv6 does extremely well and what we need to do going forward. Man, I missed my speaker notes. I should have printed them off or something. I'm winging this. I'm totally winging this. I went through this in my head like nine times this morning. Would it, would it take a whole minute to reconfigure the screens? Yeah, but I'm hyper and I'm like on a pole here. So let's just go. <laughs> so, what is my point? My point is on the next slide, honey. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. Does anybody know what this movie is from, or what this is from? What movie this is? Kelly's Heroes. Thank you! Somebody got it! This is Oddball. Why don't you knock it off with the negative waves? This was my way of saying that I was totally done bitching. Um, there are some things that IPv6 does extremely well. Um, first of all, I already hinted at this. Next slide, please, honey. Oh, dear God. So we're going back to um, our, our fictitious network of 2001 feed, which I just realized it was 2002 feet earlier, but I mean, it's fake, who cares. Um, so that insanity. Uh, how many people here know what cider is? Okay, quite a few, quite a few. How many people actually understand cider? Hoping the same set of hands, okay. How many people really hate explaining anything that isn't a classful network to non-network types? Again, the same set of hands. I just like watching their heads explode. Well, yeah, I would really do it simply to inflict pain upon them. Oh, yeah, but... Okay, so so we lose that. We lose the schadenfreude element. Yes, I can decide to teach the binary. <laughs> so, well, the fun there's only a single block size there are primary numbers. <laughs> so, primary. Some, some people actually advocate doing subnetting in V6 along the nibble boundary, and um, I don't want to have to think about that, ever. As far as I'm concerned, IPv6 is designed to have a lot of wasted space. So you've got this entire slash 32. A slash 48 is a site or a facility. Your, your security department or your engineering department or your, your accounting department. And then you can subdivide individual lands on that. This creates administrative boundaries that are very easy to define. And that would be even cooler if we had a, a totally v6 native network and didn't have to do all of this stuff in v4 in the convoluted mess that it is right now because accounting has a slash 29 of address space and security's got a slash 24 to create their honeypots and God only knows. But this is simple. Um, at one point, Aaron was actually advocating that you hand out slash 56s to last mile customers. I can't for the life of me see why anybody who doesn't actually ask for one would ever want one. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself, and you've touched on this a little bit, my friend in the Xenos shirt. But basically, our doctrine at this point has been to hand out a slash 64, and if you want more than that, if you want to do more than one broadcast domain, you want to do more than one VLAN with <coughs> six connectivity, we'll give you a 48. Just because I don't want to deal with the headache of thinking about slash 56s. Yes, I'm that lazy of an individual. I agree that your way is right, by the way. Thank 100%. you! 100%. That's what the damn 48 was meant for. That's why there's yeah. you know, 12 undecillion IP addresses. Yes, exactly. I mean, I've got 65,000 of these to give out, and inside each of those I've got 65,000. I'm going to use one of those for most of my customers. Do you know how many providers have requested a second slash 32? Yes, I know. I partner with one of them. There's something wrong with them. Because they don't use either of them. That's the best part. Oh, no, no. This company has gone through both. Really? They've actually allocated all the way through to, well, the, to the flash for Yeah, um, oh, I forgot. I was, I don't have my speaker notes. I was actually going to bitch about this. Um, another problem with this is, and uh, this, this, is, this is an Aaron rule, it's not an IANA rule. So this is a North American problem. I actually don't know what Rite or Apnic or uh, Afrinic or any of them are doing. Um, if you aren't a carrier grade network, you don't qualify for a slash 32. You qualify for a slash 48. What are they defining as carrier grade? I, I have, okay, so one of the things that's really fun is uh, Jeff. Is Jeff in here? I think Jeff's working. Is Jeff is uh, an AS number, or I think it's weirder than that. 
Because there are non-carrier networks out there that have their own ASN. Right. And all you have to be is multi-homed mm -hmm. or have a justification for more than a slash 20. It's actually easier than that. You have to have a justification for more than a slash 24. Although that's getting really hard to do with Aaron because you can't uh, you can't bust into that market because there aren't any slash 24s. Well, what happens you. is people get a slash 24 multi-home renumber so they never have to renumber again. Well, yeah, that's the theory. But um, you have if you're not multi-home, you have to justify more than a slash 20 before they'll renumber you. Yeah, yeah, it's the slow start methodology. Yeah. It's it's an interesting duck, but you can qualify for an ASN long before you qualify for your own IP space. Yeah, but you actually, become married to your providers, at least in some capacity. And I have, since I've worked at this company, we actually had Sprint United Space long after we canceled our Sprint United Circuit. We had it for like three years afterwards, and then they finally wanted it back. And it got to be kind of a tight little squeeze game. But um, a classic example of not qualifying for a slash 32 is, uh, hey, there he is. Jeff! Yeah? What the hell did you have to do to qualify for a slash 32 of V6 space? I know it was hell. About 25 paragraphs of describing what I'm going to do with it, a rough estimate of the number of sites that I was going to light, uh, an addressing plan about site layout, which was conformant with Aaron's policies, and the willingness to pay yearly fee measured in several thousand dollars. Thank you very much. There you go. How you get IPv6 when you apparently don't qualify as a carrier grade network, even though Jeff has ever been as much of a carrier as I am because he's got to deal with far more annoying users than I do. He's got college <laughs> students. <laughs> I just have end users. Um, you know how I got a slash 32? I asked. They said yes. <laughs> You have an ASN, you have a slash 19, you have some other stuff. Here you go, have a slash 32. Yeah. It's, it's very arbitrary, and given the fact that an individual slash 32 contains 65,556 slash 48s, but there's 4.29 billion slash 32s available, why are we drawing this distinction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's this a lot is a huge fight presence. within Aaron, and I will say this: Aaron has actually bought me a margarita, but they have never actually given me IP addresses. <laughs> Stingy <laughs> bastards. Well, have you ever looked at their operating budget? It's I huge. I know one of their tech uh, committee people. Owen's a friend of mine. It's horrible. But, yeah, they won't actually <laughs> give me IP addresses, but hey, if you want some alcohol, uh, ask Aaron. Oh yeah, absolutely. I've been to those conferences. They're fun. They don't let me wear a dress to those. <laughs> uh, honey, next slide. Because this one's actually interesting. Um, this is actually my favorite part about IPv6, the packet header. It's actually bigger. It's actually substantially bigger simply because the source address and the destination address are larger. Um, but it is simpler to... Um, man, I really need my speaker notes for this one. I'm going to try and remember this. I'm going to look at this for this part. It is actually simpler for a hardware router to deal with, or basically any kind of router. Uh, let's see. Jeff, help me out on my speaker packet or speaker notes with me. Okay. IHL. What does IHL stand for again? Uh, I believe that is in fact the header link because this is a type point value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it says that this is a field not kept in IPv6. Uh, actually, that's actually debatable. Um, sort of supplanted into payload length, and more importantly into the next header. What's really cool about um, what IPv6 does is it takes a bunch of this stuff. Um, identification is, was originally used for identification of fragments in v4. Um, IPv6 in intermediate hops do not fragment. It is the end host's job to do path MTU discovery, it is their job to fragment if need be, and it'll be re reassembled at the far end. That's that flags fragment offset, all just thrown out the door, thrown into what's called an extension header, which is handled by the next header field over in the V6 uh, packet, which is essentially is a little simplifying it, but basically it's a linked list address, uh, linked, linked list concept where you need to throw more information about what this packet is doing, you need to throw hop-to-hop -hop attributes into the darn thing. There's seven or nine, I forget, kinds of uh, extension headers, 
And you basically chain them together. You say, okay, the next extension header is this one, the next one is this one, and most of them are ignored by the intermediate hops. Some of them are hop-to-hop -hop attributes and are limited, are, uh, are examined there. Also thrown out options, again, thrown into an extension header and probably not examined by the intermediate routers that are just handling flinging bits back and forth. Um, padding, which is just a bunch of zeros.